Okay, this is the College of Complexes uh, for any of you who just wandered in uh, for, for the food or whatever. Uh, but we have tonight with us uh, Ryan Blitzstein, who is for Change Illinois. Yay. And what kind of change is it? Uh, well, we're going to, uh, he's concerned about honest and, and new government ethics. All right. Yeah, the one that we are ready now. The one with the poor English on it. I Having heard from all our announcers, <laughs> the, uh, let the us hear from, here from our professor Mark. for the day, uh, Ryan. Let's see. All right. You're here. Another boy. All right, thank you. Thanks for, thanks, Ron, and thanks for having me here. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. These are, these are serious issues, but they're not simple issues. So if I go on too long on anything, I, I apologize. And I also wanted to thank you for having me back, so to speak. Um, I wasn't able to make it last time, so I'm really glad to, to be here. Um, I hope everyone has one of the handouts that Charlie was so kind to, uh, to print out. Um, the front side, just so everyone knows, it's not numbered, is what fair, honest democracy looks like. But let me just get started and talk about what I'm here to talk about. So my name is Ryan Blitzstein. Um, I'm one of the leaders of Change Illinois, which is an organization that has a really simple mission. Um, we have a vision of an Illinois that is a model state for fair, honest government. Let me say that again. We have a vision of an Illinois that is a model state for fair, honest government. That everyone across the nation and throughout the world looks at Illinois and says, this is the most fair, most honest, most open, most well-run, effective government in the world. As you know, we are very, very far from it. And so what I'm going to talk about tonight is where we are, where we could be, and how to get there. So let me start with, with the problem. I know that um, we heard tonight that we're number one in terms of uh, the bond rating and the finances and everything else. Let me start with corruption. So <laughs> no secret Illinois is pretty corrupt. It's estimated that we pay a corruption tax of something like $500 million a year. So if you run the numbers on that, every man, woman, child of any age in America, or, or in this state, pay something like 40 bucks a year, just line the pockets of corrupt officials. That is literally money that's going to somebody that's connected or takes advantage of the system. And it's coming out of our pockets and the taxes that, that we pay. We're number three in public corruption based on the number of prosecutions of, of criminals. And Chicago is actually number one in America. It's the number one city for public corruption. Um, it's, it's no secret to us, so we all know this, and there have been some polls done, you know, does state government do the right thing most of the time? 15% um, of Illinoisans say yes. The other 85% uh, of us are like you and me and realize that it does not do the right thing most of the time, unfortunately. Um, I'll, I'll be honest, I'll share a bias, I am not a let's get rid of all the incumbents every time kind of guy. I think there are some good people on both sides of the aisle trying to do their best. Unfortunately, there just aren't enough of them, and they're stuck in a system that does not work. And it makes it so hard for them to do what they want to do to make things better for all of us throughout the state. We're ineffective financially. We're ineffective in terms of educating our children. We're ineffective in terms of our approach to the environment, regulation, pensions, you name it there's a reason to look at it and say this is broken. And it's not the Democrats' fault or the Republicans' fault. It's the fault of an entire system that's been built up over the last couple hundred years. Um, since the founding of the state when it was a territory, since uh, the birth of Chicago and, and Cook County. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about how we got here and, and why this is. So uh, our organization does a lot of policy research. But I'm a, a former journalist, so I spent a lot of time kind of reviewing the media reports on this. And what researchers have to say is, how did we get here? Why is Illinois so bad? Why are we number one or number three or number five, depending on how you look at it? So here are my top ten reasons that Illinois is one of the most corrupt, ineffective states in America. <laughs> number ten, from our founding, 
Illinois was essentially a swamp, both metaphorically and geographically. And people came in, developers, investors, political leaders, looking for a fast buck. And they got it. And that became the culture very early. Number nine, and this is related to that, because people were looking for a fast buck, and because it was a swamp, politicians were not people who were uh, had some sort of noble calling, like the founders of the nation that we were talking about earlier. They were folks who saw an opportunity for advancement. They saw a way for them to run for office, get elected, make some money for themselves, their families, and their friends. And that ethos isn't unique to Illinois. But there were many more people who had that sort of culture in Illinois, and it just got baked in over time, over the last couple hundred years. Number eight is money. We're a victim of our own success here. Illinois is one of the most successful states in the nation, and has been in terms of producing economic growth. We have more infrastructure than most of the other states in the Midwest. And it turns out that when a lot of money is running through a place, there's a lot of people trying to snap up bits of that money for themselves and line their own pockets. And so again, we're a victim of a lot of the successes that Illinois has had over the last few hundred years, particularly during the middle of the 20th century when things were really booming economically. Number seven, a criminal political alliance. So unfortunately, as we all know, mobsters, gangsters, pimps and prostitutes, they were all uh, connected to the politicians here in the state over the last couple hundred years. It's not as bad today as it once was when you, know, you had guys literally uh, running for office, running for aldermen, current aldermen, having their political fundraisers hosted by pimps, gamblers, prostitutes. Um, we don't do that out in the open today, but there's still a lot of nefarious stuff that's going on, and the, the remnants of that culture are really still there. Number six is a different sort of alliance, and that's an alliance between the political class and the business class. Uh, the word that's often, or phrase that's tossed around is pinstripe patronage. You know, after World War II, in a lot of states throughout America, the business community stood up and said, you know what, we're powerful, we've got money, we have influence in this community, we have seen corruption, we've seen patronage, and we're not going to take it anymore, and it needs to stop. And so there were these alliances of progressive folks at the grassroots, and business leaders, many of whom were quite conservative and free market oriented, who tried to push and make corruption stop. They were successful in many states, but it didn't happen in Illinois. Why? The simple reason is that the business community was bought off. So the politicians said, well, if you let us have corruption and keep lining our own pockets, then we'll make sure that you get the right development deal. We'll make sure that you get the right tax breaks. We'll make sure that your large businesses are able to succeed and make sure that there are barriers to entry so no one else can come and disrupt you. And you can continue to make money from here until kingdom come. And again, as in many things in terms of corruption in Illinois, not as bad as it was 50 years ago or 100 years ago, but it's still here today in, in development and in tax policy and everything else. So we're halfway through. The number five reason that Illinois is one of the most corrupt states in America is racism. During the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, um, many in the power structure, the political power structure, were, were able to essentially say to folks, particularly in Chicago, say to business leaders and other civic leaders, you know, we need to keep this a white city. We need to keep this a segregated city. And if you allow us to stay in power, we'll be able to do that. And you guys continue to fund us, so we'll stay in power. And if you look at the, the histories of 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and everything from the way that the districts map, district maps were drawn to housing policy, road policy, infrastructure policy, um, unfortunately, it benefited a very small number of people. And the, the racism that was a remnant of uh, both Illinois' past and America's past um, really affected the way that these policies were taken into account. The number four reason? is the dynasties. I don't think it's a surprise to folks, the Daly family, the Heinz family, the Stroger family, the Madigan family. It's not that any of these people are bad people, necessarily. It's not that these families are any worse than any other family. It, it is the case, however, that when you have a small number of people having an outsized amount of control, 
things aren't going to change very quickly. And we've seen these very powerful, very strong uh, dynasties of political families that are able to hold power, work the system, and perpetuate the system as it is. Whereas in many other states, you've had new political classes, new business classes, new elite classes, and also new movements coming up from the grassroots that changes who is in power. It just hasn't happened in Illinois. You know, one, one example, you know, love him or hate him, agree with him or disagree with him, our current mayor, in, in many ways, is just the next logical step of the Daly family. Um, he came up as a fundraiser within the, the uh, Daly machine. He was very close to the uh, younger Mayor Daly. Many of the people that he hired came out of, of, of that group. But again, it's not to say that, that he's a bad guy or that, that his policies are good or bad. Uh, it is to say that um, we're just continuing the same sort of power structure. We're continuing one foot in front of the other instead of stopping, hitting the reset button, and bringing some new folks and new ideas in. The number three reason is that, that we've got just a seriously labyrinthine set of governments here in Illinois. Um, if you look at the numbers, we have more townships, more units of government, more things like the Mosquito Abatement District and Metropolitan Water Reclamation District than any other state in America. And when you've got confusing government, it's very easy for the people who control the system to continue to work those levers of power, and very hard for people like us at the grassroots to take the time and spend the money to understand it, to move things in a positive direction. It also means that there's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes or behind closed doors that we as citizens don't really find out about or get to be a part of. And there's a lot of money that flows through those you know, mosquito abatement districts. And we don't know where it's going or how it's going, but you can be certain that someone is taking advantage of it. And these, we're talking about tens of thousands of units of local government all of which, or many of which overlap, and many of which don't really need to exist, to be perfectly honest, and only exist because it's in the political interest or financial interest of a large number of people in power and those that really manage the system. The number two issue, and this is less of a problem than it used to, but it was a big problem up through just 10, 20 years ago, is disclosure and the lack of openness and transparency in Illinois government. There's still a lot of stuff going on behind closed doors. We can be sure of that. But it used to be much worse. Everything was behind closed doors. Citizens couldn't see what was happening. And so when stuff is behind closed doors, you, we all know sun, sunlight is the best disinfectant. When there's no sunlight, things get really nasty here in the state, here in the city, here in Cook County. And it just was bad, bad, bad stuff, you know, as far as the eye could see. And then the, the last one, and I think this is a big reason that I come out to speak with groups you know, as, as much as I possibly can, is us. We, the citizens, the residents of Illinois, we're the reason that things are so bad. There's enough information out there now. There's enough knowledge out there now. There's enough good people who want to run for office. There's enough knowledge about how the system works that if we all stand up and said, you know what, I'm going to tell five people how broken the system is. And I'm going to get all of them to vote. And I'm going to spend time working with my friends and family to get good people elected and to, to hold them accountable once they are elected. There's a lot that we can do. I, I don't want to critique people in this room because I know you're all folks who really pay attention to this stuff and think about it and spread the word. But there are a lot of us who just become too cynical because things are so broken. You know, the really good news is that things are a hell of a lot better today than they were 20 years ago, or 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, as nasty as they are. Unfortunately, not enough of us have stood up to try and make change, to move that cycle more quickly, to make things better faster. So we were able to reach that vision that I talked about earlier that sounds crazy, but might happen in five years, or 10 years, or 20 years. Illinois as a bastion of fair, honest, open government. So I want to talk a little bit about how to fix this. And then we'll do some, some questions, and then I, I really want to hear what you all think about these issues. So if you pull out the handout, you see the details of, of this vision. And you know, as pie in the sky as it is, it turns out that it breaks down to some pretty reasonable, common sense systems. You, know, you want a lot of transparency and information out there so we can all get access to it. You want voters to be engaged and, and looking at that information and hungry for that information and making decisions based on that actually voting. 
you want elections to be clean so no one has an outsized impact on it, so it's not a couple people influencing what happens. You want voters to be able to register easily. You want them to easily be able to vote in a system that is both high integrity, so there's limited or no fraud, but also simple and user-friendly. So anyone who is eligible to vote is able to walk into a polling place and make their voice heard. You want the policymakers to be honest. You want them to be doing things based on their conscience and based on what their constituents want, as opposed to how to make as much money as they can or what the leader of their party or whoever their political patronage wants them to do. You want the lobbying process to be ethical. So, you know, we think of lobbyists as these evil, bad people who are influencing policy and they're all special interests. But what lobbying is really is groups of people making their voices heard. And if it's done in an open, honest, ethical way, and it's a fair fight, then on any given issue, if I'm a legislator, or I'm the governor, or I'm a cabinet official, I'm listening to what one side says and what the other side says. And maybe there's 50 sides to the issue. But if it's done in the right way, then I can make an intelligent decision based on my own conscience and based on what I think the people of Illinois want and what's in the best interest of all of us. You know, when that happens, you get rational legislation that's common sense. I think there's a lot of us who, if we looked at an issue, it might be really tough, but we'd make a decision that made sense to us based on the best interest of everybody. The average legislator just isn't able to do that because the system is unfortunately so broken. You want fair contracting, so the best contractor, you know, who can do the best job for us at the lowest cost, gets the contract. You want smart rulemaking, so a business isn't punished, but on the other hand, if uh, the corporate community is doing bad things to hurt citizens, that they're held accountable for that. You want effective regulation in this, the same vein. You want services to be high quality. I mean, obviously, if someone's going to the, the welfare office or someone is going to the DMV, you want it to function well and you don't want money wasted. And then the last piece, and this is sort of basic political science theory, but it's also real. You want the rule of law and justice. Yeah. If, if, if I'm being hurt by the, the state or I'm being hurt by another citizen, I want to be able to go, go to court and I want to be able to make my case. And if I'm someone who's been accused of wrongdoing or crime, I want to be able to go to court and be able to make my case. And if I'm right, if, if you know, beyond a reasonable doubt, no one can say that I'm guilty, I want to continue to have my freedom. So you know, these arguments, people who are far right and far left can look at these and say, OK, well, yeah, this is what democracy looks like. It's not about how high are our taxes. It's not about what's the right environmental policy. It's not about what's the curriculum that our children should be educated by. What it's about is creating the fundamentals of a democracy so all of us can put in as much as we can and get a lot more out. So if you flip the page over, you'll see what Illinois looks now. And I'm not going to go over these one by one, but essentially it's the mirror image of what you want. You know, instead of having voters that are really engaged, you've got disengaged, cynical folks. Instead of having contracts that are, are fair and honest, you have corrupt ones. Instead of a judicial system that makes sense and follows the rule of law, you have a, a politically motivated judicial system. You know, we, we just spent millions of dollars to get a Supreme Court justice elected. So each part of that statement that I just made is absurd. First of all, we shouldn't be spending millions of dollars on any given election. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, the people who spent that money are really two sides. It was the, the trial lawyers spent a bunch of money, and the, the folks who are afraid of the trial lawyers, the business community, spent a bunch of money. Those are the only people who care about this, even though we all should care. This is a Supreme Court justice. The fact that we're electing Supreme Court justices based on R and D also is crazy. It just doesn't make any sense, and most states, and basically every Western modern country, doesn't do it that way anymore, but in Illinois, the system is just perpetuated. So I want to talk about what can be done to fix all of these things. And the nice thing about having this model or this structure is that you've got kind of a mirror image. So you can think, like, how do we get from limited access to civic information to great transparency of information? Um, you, you've got, how do we get from heavy special interest lobbying to a fair lobbying process? And so, you know, I'm a, a former engineer. That was my training. I, I sort of think of things this way. It's, it's a system. It's, it's a machine. How do you get from place X to place Y? And in between, there's a bunch of stuff you can do. So 
the three tools that, that we use at Change Illinois are educate and, um, I'm sorry, do research, figure out what's in the best interest of citizens or what, what people think makes sense, what the best ideas are. We don't necessarily say this is the way, but we draw, this is the universe of things that are possible. So we, we do the research. Then we educate folks. We go out and we say, look, you know, we're not exactly certain what should be done. Here are three or four ways that are possible. You know, you want to fix the campaign finance system? Maybe small donor public financing is the way to go. Maybe contribution limits are the way to go. Maybe we should just have a lot of disclosure. Maybe all three are important. But we want to make sure people know that these options are on the table. And then the last piece is advocacy. We go down to Springfield, or we ask constituents and citizens like you and me to go down to Springfield, or go to Cook County or uh, city government, municipal government, and say, I believe that we need to change the system in the following way. Here's why, and here's what makes the most sense. And so, to take a step back in terms of what, what we do, um, for each of these, there isn't necessarily an obvious solution, but there's a set of options on the table. There are a set of things that have been done in other states that have worked. And there's a set of things that are politically realistic. So when we're thinking about what we do, you know, those are sort of the criteria. It's, okay, what's worked elsewhere? What seems applicable to Illinois? Um, what's doable for someone? And then what's doable for us? There are some things that Change Illinois is good at, and there are some things that we're not so good at. Um, I'll be honest, we're not uh, expertise. We, our expertise is not working behind closed doors to work the system and work the machine. Our expertise is working in a very public way to communicate to as many people as possible what needs to be done. Um, we're not experts at litigation to try and change things. We're much better at working with, you know, getting the smartest folks in the room from across the political spectrum to say, okay, what's the right amendment here, or, or what's the best possible compromise on legislation? So I'm going to, before I close up, just give you an example of a couple of the things that we've been working on. Um, in 2009, Illinois was one of five states that had no limits on how the campaign finance system worked. No limits on how much money a, a person or corporation could give to a representative. So for instance, if I were running for state rep and Corporation X wanted to spend $5 million to make sure that I was elected because it was in the interest of Corporation X, they could spend $5 million. Could do the same in a gubernatorial election, state treasurer, anything statewide. We were one of five states that had a complete lack of limits. Everyone else made changes to fix that after Watergate. Illinois did not. Why? Many of the same issues that I spoke about before. And so what we knew we needed to do, we knew there were a lot of changes to make in the, the campaign finance system, but contribution limits was the number one. So we worked with a broad coalition, diverse folks from both sides of the aisle, business leaders, labor leaders, grassroots community leaders um, from throughout the state, representing all geographies and commodities, going down to Springfield, making phone calls, calling folks, and partly as a result of the work we did, uh, there was a, a bill that was passed that Governor uh, Quinn signed that created contribution limits. It didn't fix everything, but it severely decreased the outsized influence of big money in elections and increase the power of people like you and me who can write a $20 check or a $50 or $100 check to actually make our voice heard. Um, you know, I, I agree you know, on many things. I'm, I'm a liberal, but I, I agree with the conservatives on this. You know, money is speech. Um, if I want to give 50 bucks to help someone say something, that's translating speech. That's not the same as saying, well, I want anyone to be able to spend a billion dollars to have their speech have more of an influence than mine. But we want people to have the freedom to be able to make their voice heard, whether that's <laughs> voting, telling their friends, writing a check to somebody, volunteering, whatever it is. And so this, this campaign finance reform was a really significant thing. There's a long way to go. But it did prove the model that if you bring a lot of different people together, you can start to make changes on the system. Now, the second thing that we did, which is really still ongoing, is an effort to change the redistricting process. So I don't, I don't know if, if folks here are familiar with it, but um, every 10 years after the census, in all 50 states, the state legislative and state senate districts and the congressional districts are all remapped. So you'd think there'd be some smart, nonpartisan, you know, basically census demography type folks 
who would be redrawing those maps. It turns out that in many states, including Illinois, it's actually, the maps are drawn behind closed doors by the political leaders of whichever party is in power. So I know this is getting can way you repeat that? Can you, can you say that again? Yeah, so, so the maps are drawn behind closed doors by the political leadership of whatever party is in power. And it, viscerally, that it sounds wrong and intuitively it angers you. But let me talk about what that actually means. So that means that if I'm, say, the Speaker of the House, and I don't like that, I don't like someone on the other party, um, I could draw that person out of his or her district. So I can redistrict to get rid of them. If I'm the Speaker of the House, and there's someone who is actually in my party that has not been towing the party line, that is an independent-minded thinker, that doesn't listen to me on every single issue, then I can say, you know what, I'm going to draw that person out of their district. If there's someone that does tow the party line, that agrees with me on everything and votes the way I want him or her to vote, but you know the constituents in his or her community don't really like him, and it looks like he might not get reelected, then I can draw a district map to increase the chances of his or her reelection. It is literally the politicians choosing the voters, as opposed to the other way around. It is insane, it is backward. No other Western country does it this way. It's actually illegal to redistrict this way in England, punishable by fine. And yet it's the standard operating procedure here in Illinois. There are a number of states that have made changes to this, this policy. Um, and based on that progress, uh, Illinois has started to look at the possibility of making the change here. Um, one thing that Change Illinois did was we created a model amendment based on what's been done in California, Arizona, um, you know, blue states and red states that have made these uh, nonpartisan reforms with bipartisan support. We put together this model amendment. We did a lot of public education around it. Yes for Independent Maps, which is a ballot campaign that started about two years ago to go out and try and get it on the ballot. Unfortunately, um, despite raising millions of dollars, getting thousands of people supporting it, big name folks from David Axelrod to Adlai Stevenson to uh, Governor Quinn, you know, many other folks coming out for independent redistricting, didn't quite get over the hump. Why? For legal reasons. Basically, uh, the other side spent a huge amount of money, the other side being the political machine, for better or worse, spent a huge amount of money to get it knocked off the ballot. Um, in Illinois, the way things work is it's really tough to get something before the voters to amend the Constitution. But once it's before the voters, you've got a real good shot at winning. And so you know, a lot of folks within the reform community are taking a look at seeing whether 2016 or 2018 is the right time to give it another shot. Regardless of whether there's another ballot campaign, Change Illinois is really committed to making sure that people know about this issue, understand it, understand why it's broken, and no matter what the next redistricting process is, in 2021, making sure that people understand it well enough so that they can advocate for their interests, so that it's a redistricting process based on citizen needs and the needs of residents and real people, not the needs of a handful of politicians. The, the last piece, and this is something that we just had a big win on just over a month ago, was on voting rights. So you know, if you look at the normal story of voting rights, it's the Republicans want voter ID to make it harder to vote, and the Democrats want <coughs> tons of access to make it easier to vote. And forget the what's good for the world and what's good for, for <coughs> presidents. Um, it's seen in a political way. We don't think of it that way. We think of it in a nonpartisan way. As I said before, it should be simple, user-friendly, and high integrity. That's what the right election system should be. Anyone who is eligible to vote and wants to vote should be able to vote easily one time. And the way our system works is it's extraordinarily antiquated. It's paper and pen based. There's nothing digital. It's not modernized. We're, we've been way behind other states. And most important, it's very difficult to register, and everything has been based on arbitrary deadlines. So we were able to work with a very diverse coalition to go down to Springfield and advocate for changes. We were victorious in December. And so now the system will be modernized. It'll be more digital. It'll be more high integrity. Um, the, the voter rolls will be based on real people, real data, 
real information, so no one can vote twice. And fraud, if it was ever a problem, which frankly I don't believe it is here in Illinois, if it was ever a problem, it will not be a problem, again, because the system will be better. And many people, particularly young people, communities of color, and seniors, a lot of mobile folks who move from place to place, are still able to correct their registration and make their voice heard on election day. So these are three things we're working on. There are many, many more that we'd like to do. And again, these are big problems. This is a 200-year problem. We're not going to fix it in 10 minutes or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. But I, I think if I leave you with anything, excuse me, tonight, I, I do want to leave you with an impression that these problems are addressable. We don't have to completely solve them. But if you take a big step back and look at the last 500 years of human history, the general story is People at the grassroots gaining power, the elites giving up power. More freedom, more ability to express ourselves, more, more power in which government is more responsive to what the people want. Sure, we've had ups and downs and strikes and gutters in that area, but overall, the general story is that things have gotten better. And it's our job here in Illinois, a place that is worse than a lot of other places, to first of all, catch up with the other 49 states of the Union and also to start to move ahead, become that place that is seen as a model so that others can look to us and help move things forward for everyone, all citizens, all ages, all demographies. So thanks for having me here, and, and I'm happy to take questions. All right. That's all right. Let, let her go first. All right. Mary Beth. Okay. I have this theory. Isn't the crux of the problem the way issues are being covered by mainstream media in the first place? The old, the old line: if it bleeds, it leads, and uh, and issues that could affect a, a community, not to think of an entire city, it's not even covered. And that is a large part of the problem. I'm kind of shy. Did you want to introduce the answer? No. All right. It's it's a, a great question, and as a, a recovering journalist, um, you know I say guilty as charged. <laughs> I think that unfortunately the the media doesn't always have the the time or the resources to cover things. Uh, we'll move it another way. Reporters don't always have the time or the resources to cover things the way that they want to be covered. And so what you often get is things that are based on what's the best way to sell as many papers or get as many viewers as possible, as opposed to you know, dealing with really important issues. That said, I, I do want to say that the media, in general, in Illinois, has been extraordinarily supportive of these reform issues. I think uh, the Chicago Tribune, Chicago Sometimes in particular, but also papers in Peoria, Rockford, Carbondale, and throughout the state over the past few years since I've been in this role, have time and again, uh, the Daily Herald out in the suburbs as well, time and again highlighted these issues and, and the editorial pages have said, this matters, we understand how corrupt our state is, this really needs to change. So I, I, I take your, your point as, as very legitimate. These stories aren't written about as much as they should be. The day-to-day -day reporting doesn't reflect it and the, the what's on the front page unfortunately doesn't. On the other hand, the editorial boards have been really supportive. And, and I do think, you know, as a former journalist, it's tough to write about these issues because you know, the redistricting process is a 10-year thing that no one's paying attention to right now. But if we're not paying attention to it right now, then the next time it comes around, we'll be caught flat-footed again, and we'll get these you know, disgusting gerrymandered maps, and we won't be able to do anything about them. Yes. Uh, here we are. Yes. Okay. Okay. So, so you think it's, it's fair if, okay, see, you know, I'm from former Soviet Union, from Russia, okay, I know it was different system and everything, but we never heard of it, like somebody, a member of the government, give job to him, what, to his wife, or to his her husband, or to her daughter, so you think it's normal and it's really eligible, like some husband give job to his wife? Like, I, I don't want to mention names, but I guess it's, you know, it, like, you know, like, 
Okay, for instance, fine, I will tell about Medigan or whatever the name. Medigan and his daughter. And, and how other people reacted? Do you think it's fair for other people who really don't have a job and who try, probably can give good service to the public and to, to society? So I don't think it's right like to promote wife or husband to give job, you know, like if, if they if they got government or whatever. It's so the, right. the issue of, of nepotism has always been a problem in, in political life. It's always, you know, how can I get this person a job who I know? How can I take care of take care of them? I mean, that's the, the family business is part of it. And as I said, these dynasties just perpetuate themselves. Yeah, but this yeah. is not business; it's government job. And right. my very quick question, if I may. Sure. How people can how people can fight about it? How people can argue about not to give job to spouse and Daughter and, and do the same, and ha 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 ha, they so happy, and other people, you know, like, and they not really do too much for society, these people. You know, they met with public and they make believe they do something. But you know, I was in several meetings because I received by mail, you know, um, invitations, and they was like, they not here, they like thousand miles away with their mind. So, how it can be. Corruption. I call this corruption. Yeah, can question, be fight for yeah. Okay. What's your yeah. opinion? You no, know, so so my my opinion on this is that nepotism is sort of a symptom or a microcosm of a much larger problem, which is the the problem of incumbency and incumbent protection, and the protection of the the ruling class of the folks who are powerful, which is that. I will take care of my folks. It doesn't matter to me whether someone's hiring uh, his wife or her husband or someone's hiring their golf buddy. It's, it's all about, is someone being hired or given a contract for a government job or a government contract that isn't qualified in the place of someone who is qualified, who is more deserving? Right, and, and unfortunately it happens all the time. I, I do think the good news is we have a very powerful, not just um, mainstream media, but a you know a blogosphere and Twitter sphere and other places that people are paying attention to this much more than they were before. And unfortunately, there aren't specific laws in a lot of cases to um, to, to push these things out of the way. So the, the way it, it needs to happen is uh, someone pays attention by going to a public meeting and tweeting about it, or a reporter writes about it. Then more people find out about it. They spread the word. Then there's outrage and anger, and then then there's change. Um, I, again, I don't have statistics on this. My belief is this is less of a problem today than it was before, and the reason for that is because of greater openness. But it's still an issue, and you know I, I'm not an expert on the former Soviet Union. I'm not an expert on many other places, including Illinois, frankly. Right? You know there are other people who look more deeply at these issues, but this this is a problem. And the only way that we're going to get rid of this nepotism issue is if people stand up and say, this is wrong. It's, it's got to change. And that's not to criticize any particular son or daughter or husband or wife. It's well, just not to vote next time for something. <coughs> yes, that's, that's right. OK. okay. Chris. You just had a question, and you guys had tackled, you know, some three big issues in you know, the state of Illinois, and yet we have um, questions about how open the media is, and um, just curious as to what your group has been doing at the grassroots level, mm -hmm. the community who are really feeling this effect of a lot of institutionalized, whether it be racism or illegalities with, with voting, what are some of the grassroots efforts that you've done? Sure, so I, I, I do want to say that um, I talked before that there are some things we're great at and there are some things that are not our expertise. Um, we're, we're not a grassroots organization. The way we work is we work with many partners, um, dozens and dozens of them, from AARP to social justice groups on the west side to Tea Party groups downstate. Those are the groups that are really doing the work at the grassroots. So we, you know, we take a cue from them in terms of what folks are saying at the grassroots but also you know, help provide them with resources, whether it's monetary or technical support or ideas, to help move things at the grassroots level. So you know, one, one example is a lot of our partners do a huge amount of voter protection during municipal elections and statewide elections to make sure that, that if there is, you know, whether, whether it's racism or just generally trying to hurt one party or another, 
um, that that's stopped and that there's lawyers there to stop it and that there's media or um, you know in, individual advocates to stand up and say this is wrong this this needs to stop um, you know another thing that's really important to us is making sure that it's not just people like me uh, who work downtown going to Springfield or going to City Hall to say we think this is wrong but really to engage our partners and their folks down at the grassroots to stand up and say, we think this is wrong and this thing needs to change. So it's something that over time, you know, a big goal of our coalition is to broaden and diversify the, uh, the movement for political reform. Right now, there's probably, I don't know, 50,000 people in the state who really deeply care about these issues. And we need to get to 500,000. Um, 500,000 would be about 1 in 10 voters, a little less than that. And once you have 1 in 10 voters, then you've got a real constituency, and then you can really move things. And, and to your point, you're right. The only way to get to 500,000 is to start doing serious work at the grassroots. And so we're working hard with our partners to help them try and um, move grassroots folks to, to care about that. I, I think part of the issue is that the average man or woman on the street they're not thinking about these issues, right? They're not, they're not interested in ethical lobbying or the redistricting process. They're interested in, is my community safe? Is the school I send my children to a good school? What does the environment look like? Um, is my small business stuck up in red tape? And so one of the things we spend a lot of time doing is working with our partners to try and connect these day-to-day you know, -day bread and butter issues with the deeper issues of the structures of government and the fact that the reason they're having so many problems on the day-to-day -day bread and butter issues is because the structures of democracy are failing us. And that if we can only fix these, then the day-to-day -day issues like education and the environment, um, we can come up with reasonable <coughs> compromises that work for as many people as possible. Okay. Tim Bolger. Okay. You know, you've been talking a lot about reforms of the state. Mm -hmm. um, possible methodologies for reforming the state. Can you give us some examples of countries, states, or municipalities that might be doing it right that we can take a look at research and base a model off of what good governance could be? Sure. So I, I think here are just a couple examples in, in our area. So the, the redistricting reform that we've been pushing, um, that was modeled on what's done very similar processes, a little different in each, in Arizona and California. So in California, uh, that was a, a state that, like Illinois, is a blue state that has a very large number of Republicans. It's similarly diverse. Um, it's, it's a similarly um, diverse business type state. So there's, there's a lot of similarities between Illinois and California. A big difference, of course, is, is that we're an older state um, and they have much more immigration, but they're similar. In California, they had a lot of the same corruption issues, a lot of the same pension issues, a lot of the same tax issues, uh, environmental issues, education issues that we have. They pushed a redistricting reform in 2008. They pushed a couple other reforms, too, that were done at, at the ballot. And you got a different type of legislator coming in. It wasn't more Democrats or more Republicans that changed things. It was a different kind of Democrat, a different kind of Republican. No matter how far to the right or left they were, they were willing to walk in and say, let's get something done together. So that's not to say bipartisanship for bipartisanship's sake makes sense, or that the middle solution always makes sense. It's that no matter what you believe, you've got to be thinking, what's the best thing for the entire state of California? And they were able to get major uh, pension reform passed, education reform passed, uh, tax reform, uh, environmental changes, uh, and in addition, the Sacramento Kings got a new stadium, which everyone was really excited about. <laughs> but what's amazing is that these changes were supported by labor, and 19 of the 20 were supported by the Chamber of Commerce. Um, the only one that wasn't supported by the California Chamber of Commerce was a law that taxed people who made more than a million dollars a year, which was supported by you know the vast majority of people within the state of California. <laughs> so that, that isn't to say we need to be exactly like California. It is to say that when you make these structural changes, you start to see a change in the way the legislature works in the state of capital. Um, on the campaign finance issue, I'll just give one example. Um, 
New York is starting to do at the, the city level a small dollar public financing. So essentially what that means is I'm a candidate. Uh, if I raise a small donation, that's matched four to one or five to one or six to one. So it increases the power of grassroots donations. Because you know this there's this weird situation now, and it's the case in Illinois, even with the limits we have, is if I'm running for office, it's worth a, a lot more of my time to go out and ask one person for a $5,000 check than it is to ask 100 people for $50 checks. But if the $50 checks are suddenly worth 300 or 400 or 500, then it starts to change the game a little bit. And that really has just started there. There's a lot of city-based and municipal changes that have been done in Oregon and other states that we're seeing really good things come out of. And there is, I'll be honest, there is no perfect state, but if you talk to folks in D.C. or New York who really look at this nationally, state by state, or in the National Council of State Legislatures, there's a consensus as to things that generally work and things that generally don't work. And the, the quibbling or the arguments are really around the margins or the specifics of the reform, not around the, you know, the big headline of what needs to be done. What's a good website to find this stuff at? Sure. So. Um, there are, there are several different. So one, as I mentioned, the National Council of State Legislatures, I think has a lot of good stuff. Um, there's a, the Bipartisan Policy Center in Washington, D.C. is an organization that does a lot of work on national reform, particularly on election modernization issues. Um, another one, and, and full disclosure, this is a uh, liberal-leaning progressive organization, is uh, Demos. They, they do a lot of work on these reform-oriented issues, and it'll have a progressive slant. Um, but I think the work that they do, most of it, uh, Republicans and Democrats can agree on, independents as well. Would you repeat the other ones? Uh, uh, Dean? Yeah. We have so many illegal immigrants in this country the last 10 or 15 years. What's the big issue with this voter identification? Why a big fight over this? I mean, what's the problem with getting a voter ID? I mean, this is 10, 15 years we've been talking about this thing, and we still fight over it. For what? What's the purpose of it? Should we let the illegal immigrants control some of our local elections? I mean, is it possible? So I, I, I do want to be clear that you know, our organization and our partners advocate, cur currently our, our focus is, is not, you know, every single person who is here in Illinois today can vote. Our focus is that pe everyone who is eligible to vote can vote. So if someone has come here as an, it, uh, uh, contravening the law, you know, as, as an immigrant, they're not eligible to vote. If someone has come here legally and is a legal resident, but they're not a citizen, they are not eligible to vote. So our focus really is on ensuring that everyone who is a citizen of this state is able to vote. Uh, uh, and to, to be clear, a lot of our partners believe that legal residents and even you know, illegal immigrants should be able to vote. That's, that's not, we're a broad, diverse coalition. But our focus is on if someone is eligible to vote and the state says that they're eligible to vote, it should be easy for them to vote. And if you look at how difficult it is for many people, particularly low-income folks, to even get identification and get to the polls, it becomes a um, very, it's just a very difficult process for them. So even just to go to the DMV and get a state ID, you know, may may cost twenty dollars, thirty dollars, forty dollars, whatever it is. Um, if if you look at the data, there's the groups that are hurt by these voter ID laws are disproportionately people who vote Democrat. So for, forget um, whether you are a Democrat or Republican doesn't doesn't matter. If you look at the facts, um, these voter ID laws are pushed by. Republicans, they are never pushed by Democrats, and when when they're pushed by Republicans, no matter what the talking points say, all of the research indicates that there's a certain class of people who have these difficulties. It's it, you know the, the illegal immigrant issue is um, not relevant to focusing on citizens, right? If I'm a citizen of, of this country and I have a right to vote, my my belief, our organization's belief is that it should be easy for me to do so. Uh, that doesn't mean that I should be able to vote twice, and it doesn't mean that, that someone who is not a citizen should be able to easily vote, but it, it does mean it should be simple and user-friendly to do so in a high-integrity way. And the, the difficulty for many people of getting the idea 
getting to the poll, registering right now makes it very difficult for them to do so. I can't see the difficulty in this. You know, what, I mean, this, we're talking about this for 10, 10 years now, 10, 15 years. I mean, can't somebody get an ID in 10, 15 years? Yes. And, and I, I went to vote, and they didn't even ask me for my, I'm going to show my ID. They don't even want to look at it. They didn't even look at it. That's, is that right? I'm not going to have been an Ill illegal voter. So, so you didn't even ask me for my ID. So you could have been, but there are, there are many states, including Wisconsin, that has a Republican governor that have done extremely, extremely detailed investigations looking for fraud and have not been able to find it. So if, if Scott Walker, who clearly is a very conservative guy, who is a strong supporter of voter ID laws, was not able to find fraud in his state, I, I think folks would have a hard time showing that, that, that fraud exists. Uh, yes, Howard's not. The state is in uh, dire financial uh, problems. Uh, it's practically bankrupt. Would you go through the history of that and the causes and uh, the, p the possible uh, relief? Sure. So I, I want to be clear that we're entering an area where I'm not an expert. My, my um, expertise really is much more focused on the, the structures of government, democracy, and how it functions. But as, as you said, because the state is practically bankrupt, <coughs> the financial situation of the state affects everything we do in a way that is, it may as well be a structural issue. So I, I think that the organization that I personally trust most that I'd recommend folks um, take a look at on these issues is the Civic Federation, which is based here in the city. Um, they have very detailed reports on both the state finances, potential options for reform, as well as the history of, of how we got here. Um, I, I don't think it's any secret how we got here. Uh, essentially, we spent more money than we could afford. It. And we did it for a very, very long time. And the people who s made the decision to spend that money either did it for political reasons, because it helped them get reelected. Um, they did it for reasons to help themselves, to juice their own pensions or the pensions of, of their friends. Or, or they did it because they knew it wouldn't really affect them. I mean, if you think about it, let's, let's say I'm the whatever it is, whether I'm running a city agency or I'm the state legislative committee that's deciding how much money um, we're going to give the CTA bus, bus drivers this year. It's pretty easy to be able to say, well, you know what? We're not going to give you a raise because we don't want to put more money into the budget this year. But what we're going to do is we're going to give you more money in your retirement. And guess who pays for that? Taxpayers do, but not for 10, 20, 30 years. And that conversation multiply it by 100 times, and then multiply it by a 50 or 60 year history. With a handful of corrections over time, you know, there's some work that um, Governor Edgar had done in, in the 90s. Um, there, there was uh, a consensus uh, pension, <coughs> excuse me, pension bill last year that a lot of people on both sides of the aisle supported, but we still have a really, really rough time. And I, I think the, the last reason that this has happened is that Illinois is not as strong of an economy as it once was. We have extraordinarily high unemployment <coughs> rates. The business is not doing well as, as it was. Um, we happen to have some sectors of the economy that Illinois rely on, things like manufacturing, that just aren't as strong as they were 50 years ago. And you know, some of these forces are global in nature, and there's nothing we can do about it. But some of them are, are things that you know, People made bad decisions, whether it was in government or in the private sector. And I, I personally believe, again, I don't consider myself an expert on this, but having looked at the numbers as much as I could and talking to folks who are experts, I'm confident that we can get out of this mess with the you know, right intelligent thinking. Um, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, there's ways of looking at it. Basically, we either raise more revenue, which is either taxes or fees, or we start spending less money. And we can either pull the Band-Aid off quickly, or we can pull the Band-Aid off really slowly, or we can do something in between. And I think reasonable people can disagree as to what the right way to do it is. Um, you know, the, the current or, or go, incoming governor was elected on a platform of essentially pull the Band-Aid off. So it very well may be that the state finances, if not being fixed, they're in much better shape two years from now or three years from now than they are today. If that's the case, there will be a lot of pain. 
On the other hand, it may be possible that um, you know what what soon to be Governor Rauner um, promised during the campaign, he's not able to deliver for whatever political reasons, or because the state legislature has a lot of power. Um, this isn't going to get solved. I, be I believe that the financial system isn't going to get solved until these structural democracy issues are addressed. We don't have to fix everything that's on this sheet, but I think the sooner we start addressing several of the things on this sheet, the easier it will be for you know, citizens who care and, and leaders in the community to stand up and say, this needs to be fixed, and for government to actually respond. No, you didn't. Okay, Rita Maliotis. Um, I wanted to ask you about uh, what else besides redistricting could be an answer for getting more voices in um, elections. In <coughs> Illinois, it is very difficult for third parties to get on the ballot. Mm -hmm. Redistricting is not going to solve that. And uh, the, the uh, major parties just make more rules for other parties that they have to follow in order to keep them off the ballot. So are there any solutions that you see that can help more voices get into the debate? So I, it's a really good question, and it, it's something that I've looked at a fair amount. We don't have anything currently on the table that we're working on, but here are some ideas that um, folks have talked about. I think a, a big one is for third parties to just get better at doing what they've been doing. So you know, what, I, I, I don't want to say, well, it's the Green Party's fault that they're not on the ballot, but it is the case that when the Green Party or the Libertarian Party or other smaller parties in this state raise more money, organize more people, have a strong message, um, they are able to get on the ballot and compete in a legitimate way. Um, we've seen that happen in many other states that, again, I don't want to lay it at the foot of the folks doing it because the system is very, very biased toward Republicans and Democrats. But that's, you know, solution number one is just go out and do a better job. In terms of changing the system, I, I think one is that it's very difficult to deal with the election law and election codes in this state. Uh, getting people knocked off the ballot for petition signatures issues is a blood sport. And, you know, I was involved in this ballot initiative campaign, independent maps last year, that really had that, that issue. That it's just very difficult to collect signatures in the right way and have the right lawyers and under, understand the law when you're going up against people who do this every day and are much better funded and literally wrote the law so they know the intricacies of it. So I, I, I do think that finding a way to alter election law and that election code in Illinois to, for, for instance, make it simple, to decrease the number of signatures necessary to get on the ballot, um, that's, that's something that, that would be significant. I do think if um, uh, independent parties or third parties, whatever you want to call it, non-major non, um, yeah, yeah. parties, were to pull together and start spending more money on lawyers Sugar. to figure out how to take advantage of these codes, and then they could really compete better to get folks on the ballot. Um, there are a lot of folks who are big believers in uh, what is called multi-member districts, and also ranked choice votes. You know, the idea, we used to have this before the cutback in 1981, that um, you know, there would be, instead of three districts, you would have one district with three different representatives. And there's a lot of experimentation in that now out in municipalities, I think there's some in the western suburbs. And that's, that's so that I can actually vote for, say, the Green Party first, and if you're doing ranked choice, I can vote for the Republican second or the uh, Democrat second. And if, if my person wins, that's a big deal, and I'm, I haven't wasted my vote. But if my person loses, then I get my number two. And so there's a lot of folks that, that are looking at that. I, I do know that um, the Joyce Foundation, which is a change Illinois funder, has made several grants to nonprofits to do research in that area and how it works in other countries and other states and how we can bring it here to Illinois. Uh, what about the Australian or related ballot? So I'll. Again, we're moving a little bit beyond my expertise, but I, my, my understanding is that's a specific form of ranked choice voting, where you can give um, three votes to one person, or one, one, you get three votes and you give three to one person, or one, one each. In your the list of candidates. Yes. You vote for uh, a certain number of candidates, and uh, uh, then uh, 
your votes are counted uh, uh, by their weight. Yes. Yeah, and there's there's also you know another variation is the instant runoff. That instead of you know as we have in in Chicago where if the mayor doesn't get 50% of the vote, there's a runoff. This would be, if the mayor doesn't get 50% of the vote, then um, the, if you voted for someone who's number one, you're number one, and they're number three in the, the finishing, it goes down to your number two person, and your number two person then gets, gets added in. And you know, the, these are a little more complex than a simple all or nothing, up or down, I'm voting for this guy or this gal. But it turns out that you, if you add a little bit of complexity and you explain it to people in a common sense way, they understand it. And it does increase the power of not just third parties, but also um, minorities. And I mean that in the, the broadest sense of, of the term, communities of common social and economic interest. So folks who believe something economically or, or come from a specific demographic group or racial or ethnic group are able to increase their chances of having influence. Whether they win or not isn't the biggest issue. It's whether they have influence over whoever wins or who is running for re-election. Tim Baldry. All right, I'm just curious. What about your own background? Uh, do you do this full time, or are you part? Do you like do this as a part time job? Uh, give us, you know, a little bit about your background. I mean, just just so that the internet audience can know a little bit more about who you are. Sure. So um, I, I consider myself very lucky that I get paid full time to do this work, and you know it's it's due to the generosity of um, institutions like the Joyce Foundation, the McCormick Foundation, and also a lot of private individuals who, you know, a couple days ago we got ten dollars on credit card from a woman on the south side on the side, and you know because folks want to invest in this work and move forward reform. Um, you know, a, a small lucky few people like me are able to do this work full time, and, and it's it's not just an, an avocation on the side. It really is what we do as our day jobs. Um, and I think the the strength of the reform community is based on the fact that there are people who can really um, dig into this in in a big, deep way. Me and, and many other folks. Um, my my own background is that I'm a, a fifth generation um, Illinoisan, so. My family's been here a really long time. Um, my wife's also from here, and, and our, our son was born, and he comes from a long line of, of folks who are here. Um, and it's, it's, the state is really important to me personally, and that's a big reason that, that I'm in this role. Um, I, I studied um, something called symbolic systems, which is sort of like artificial intelligence, information science. Um, and so I see the world in, in that way. I also studied uh, journalism as well, and I was a journalist writing for places like uh, Time and the New York Times, um, Chicago Tribune. Um, immediately before this job, I worked at a foundation in education philanthropy. So the sort of through line here is that I, I love looking at really hard, complex systems, researching them, figuring out what's wrong with them and, and how they can be fixed, and then um, organizing people to move towards systemic change. And I really see Illinois as a broken system and a system that could potentially be rationalized if we all just stand up and say, hey, we don't like how this is working, and it's possible to make it better. Was okay, that I have Medill? a question. No, I, believe it or not, I was rejected from Medill when I went to Columbia in New York. I, Medill Cubs. was my first choice. Cubs or Sox fan? Uh, <laughs> They're a lot. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, so oh, my question uh, is, do you believe, do you uh, believe in UFO and some like okay. another life and the different planets. Do you believe in UFO? So <laughs> <laughs> I've never I've never been asked this in a public forum before. Is he asking, do you believe in UFOs? Do you mm -hmm. believe in UFO in different uh, civilization, perhaps in, in different planets? So I I'll I'll be honest. It's an area that I haven't looked at a lot. It's very it's very clear to me as it is to most people that there are unidentified flying objects out there. Like yeah, yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, a bunch of aliens in Illinois, that's how we're late. Yeah. 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 I knew we were crazy. <laughs> oh, uh, Mary, yes. Mary, Mary. As, as a, <laughs> okay, as a follow-up to the previous question about, you know, where are your financial source, you know, sure. donations come from, can you tell me 
Is it more institutional? Is it more grassroots? Where does Change Illinois get the bulk of its funding? Sure. So um, actually, all of this is, is public information. Um, it's on our uh, audited financial statements in 990s that we filed with the IRS. So um, you know, we, we believe in transparency, and so we live transparency every day. The vast majority of our funds are from institutions. Um, the two biggest donors that I mentioned are the Joyce Foundation and the Robert McCormick Foundation. Um, you know, these, these are major civic actors in, in Illinois. Um, you know, no one would accuse them of being fronts for Democrats or Republicans or any other party. Um, they, they really are led by folks who are diverse and nonpartisan and really want to move things forward for the state. Um, they fund us. I think particularly in the case of McCormick, they fund us for the same reason they fund civic education um, in high schools, which is that they want the state to be a better state, no matter what people believe politically. Yes. All right. Charles? Yeah, I, so we adopt all these wonderful changes, and, and then Alec comes along and gets himself a legislator and puts a piece of drafted but law in front of them. What are you doing to stop that? So uh, I'll, be, I'll be very clear. Um, our organization is, is nonpartisan. We don't take a position on any issue other than these structural issues of government. And so um, we're not at all focused on what do we do to stop Alec or the Koch brothers <coughs> on the right or Tom Steyer and George Soros on the left from pushing any legislation on, on any issue. Um, our belief is that if you get the rules of the game right and you get the structures of government right, then the government will be more responsive to what the people want. Um, so I've, I've, we're not doing this to protect people from ALEC. Many of our coalition partners um, are, and they're doing a lot of work that, that is um, nonpartisan in nature, but more focused on progressive issues. Uh, many of our coalition partners are doing nonpartisan work that's more focused on conservative issues. So I don't want to paint us as something that, that we're not. We, the reason we're able to do what we do, and the reason we're actually able to make progress, is that we're not specifically saying, this is the solution to the pension crisis, this is the solution to the education crisis, these people are right and these people are wrong. Our focus really is about um, creating a better democracy. And once we have that better democracy, then it's up to other folks to work to advocate on one side or the other. Yes, Tim. Just according to the most recent Illinois data from MUFON, there was over 3,025 UFO sightings or reports in Illinois last year. Charlie. Uh, now we all know. Charlie, this is going to the intro, but this is my question for you. You got a question? Okay. Yes, Dan. What, what do you say about third party? Uh, do you have anything to do with third party initiatives? So, um, so as, as I was saying in response to the woman's question, just about how to make it easier for minority parties or third parties to get involved. Um, you know, our, our focus really is on a government that is fair, honest, open, and responsive to what citizens want. And so if the structure of democracy are working well and the people of Illinois want a third party or a fourth party, then if the system is working well, it's more likely to happen. Um, it, it may be, and you know, there are many functional states where it's Republicans and Democrats, or uh, Labor and Tory, or Labor and Conservative. I, I think that our focus really is about how do you make the structures of government work. And I, I don't want I don't want to punt on, on this one, but it's it's just really not our focus. Our our work is really about making the system better, um, and it's up to others to advocate for their party or or their political interests. Yes, Charles. Yeah, you recommended. Uh, the Civic Federation. Now, I've been at public hearings where the Civic Federation, they always speak before I do, and they recommended that senior citizens be made to pay transit fare, the transit fare gets increased, and that the unions get busted and thrown out of public transit. Is this the kind of organization that I should what, take advice from? So I, I don't want to, um, just to be clear, I don't want to recommend the policy proposals 
of the Civic Federation. We, we as an organization do not advocate on specific policies, pensions, or education, or anything else. Um, I, I do think that people on left, right, and center, no matter what their proposal or solution is, agree that the Civic Federation has solid data in terms of how state finances function today. So um, again, I, I don't want to take a position on where they are, whether you should trust them, and what is to be done. Um, I, I do want to say that my belief is that the facts they have are accurate. What? <laughs> Would you agree that they're not one of the darkest organizations in this state? <laughs> Are, you're asking, are they one of the darkest organizations? Yes, if not the darkest. <coughs> and I'm going to get financial advice from them. So, so just I to be clear, your ticket is um, you know, as as is often said, we're we're all entitled to our own opinions. We're not entitled to our own facts. And the number the numbers are there clear as day in terms of what the problem is, what the solution is. I think we can all reasonable people can disagree over. Um, I don't, I don't want to come out here and say, trust this organization on uh, how to do senior transit fare or how to deal with labor unions. Um, I do want to say, in terms of the actual numbers, um, they're one of a very small number of organizations that has put the time in to take advantage of uh, the data that are out there and, and present it in a simple way. There's another one that's part of the um, University of Illinois' uh, uh, School of Government and Public Affairs um, that that has similar though um, more detailed data. And if, if anyone's interested in that, uh, you can email me Ryan at changeil.org, and I'll send you the name of the the, um, you, the center name escapes me right now. Oh, well, that better than silk. I already talked to the devil. <laughs> <laughs> well, so we know that. We will have to move to our. Uh, rebuttals. Rebuttal period. So I feel like we heard some rebuttals. Let's <laughs> let's thank our speaker one more time. Thank you. All right. All right. Good. 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 How many have rebuttal remarks yeah. to make? Oh, 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 all right. Um, uh, oh, me. Yes, I will give rebuttal remarks. Want to go and five I'll or seven? Uh, five minutes or seven minutes, Brom? Five. Up to seven minutes. Oh. 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 <laughs> All right. Okay. Well, um, it's quite fair to uh, rebut rebutters. In fact, uh, the, our speaker gets a chance to rebut rebutters uh, at the end of uh, the rebuttal period. So, all right. Um, I remember my first impression of uh, Chicago politics, uh, or at least it was a fairly early one. I heard the late great uh, Bernard Stone, uh, the alderman from the 50th Ward, uh, who was the longest, I think, <laughs> serving alderman, <laughs> uh, speaking uh, uh, at a re-election uh, 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 forum uh, in the 50th and 49th Ward. And he was defending nepotism. He said nepotism was a pretty good system because you know uh, the, the person that uh, you're, you're hiring and uh, at least they're, they're, they're going to be uh, reliable because they know that they got their job of, uh, from, from you and you can trust them. Uh, however, somebody else, uh, if, if they come through civil service, you don't know them. They might not like you, and they might be sabotaging you, and you don't want that. So I think that there is some sense, uh, in, in, even in nepotism, 
uh, and uh, I agreed uh, with uh, Mr. Stone to the degree uh, that uh, he, uh, uh, where, where uh, offices are elected, uh, uh, there, there should be some uh, leeway uh, in, in uh, hiring uh, the people who might support you or might not support you uh, and who are uh, concerned and interested in the, uh, the functioning of the office. All right. Uh, however, uh, civil service is generally the, the answer uh, to uh, uh, nepotism. Uh, but that doesn't work all the time either. Uh, of course, uh, civil services, you, you make up tests, and some tests are, are oriented uh, towards certain people and uh, not others. Uh, who you can use just about any system, elective or otherwise, redistricting, uh, 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 the slates, uh, whatever, uh, I suppose you elect uh, your Congress people uh, from across Illinois. Well, they're not going to represent particular districts so much as particular interests uh, that uh, get them elected. And that might be uh, quite extraneous from Illinois. Uh, so, uh, the slates are drawn up by parties, uh, and uh, that means that uh, you may have m multiple parties representing multiple uh, particular interests. That doesn't need, uh, since it's impossible, I mean, to to, as a voter, know what is good for the library, the sanitation district, the water reclamation district, uh, the police district, the uh, all the different districts in your bailiwick. Uh, it's yeah. Uh, how does the voter get informed and? Uh, express their interest and in a way that, it, unless there is a system of every bona fide candidate, that is, eligible candidate, being able to directly inform every voter, uh, and the voter go through all the choices uh, and, and questions before the uh, candidate, uh, the voter is at, at a loss uh, to be an effective uh, voter on all questions. And one has to select what questions are most pertinent to you. Uh, and that's generally uh, uh, those are uh, boiled down to uh, economic and social interests. All right, uh, which is, yeah, Mary? Yeah, I would like to. Not, All right. It's not so much a... Uh, you know, up front. Yeah. All right, all right, all right. All right. All right. Encore. Encore. Get up and start your formal remarks. You got seven minutes and go. Okay. We'll take less than uh, seven minutes to be sure. Again, as I said in my opening question, I think it really comes down to are all the candidates, let's take uh, an office like mayor, where Rahm Emanuel has been all over, you know, the airwaves. And, and where do you get information on the other candidates that are running? It's zip. That is really the crux of the problem. Why could we devise a system whereby if 
what well, candidate A gets this much exposure, we will give by virtue of the fact that the airwaves really belong to the public, give exposure to candidate B, C, or D. So they have an equal chance in getting their message out. And I think that's where we can begin, is perhaps doing that, and maybe get around that disastrous Citizens United you know, decision that has so poisoned politics on the national level. Can you explain what that means? Citizens United, we don't know what that means. It's, it, it's that horrible Supreme Court decision that equated money to free speech. You can give all the money so, you want. Yeah, all the money that you want. So if, so if candidate A gets $1 million, can B, C, and D get that same amount of money? That might cut down on some of the nonsense, you know, out there. So when we send a political contribution someplace, it's usually to put some kind of ad in which half of it is lies. Anyway, that's a hell of a way to keep the public informed. All right. Go ahead. I believe. All right, all right. I believe that the electoral process in Illinois definitely needs an overhaul, and that first priority should be to make the process more fair, so that there are more voices um, and more choices on the ballot. Um, I'm going to give you. Um, a couple of examples. First of all, um, the election law itself is controlled, obviously, by the two parties, which shall be named, unnamed right now, um, as everybody knows. And so every time anybody makes, uh, anybody's allowed on the ballot or surprises them and gets on the ballot, they simply change the law so that you can't do that anymore. Um, it happened in 2006 when the Greens surprised the Democrats and became an established party. So they were then allowed to slate candidates across the state. So even if they got all their lawyers out, and I was one of the people that they challenged when I was trying to get on the ballot for state rep, they brought, they brought their lawyers out and knocked me off the ballot, even though I had plenty of signatures, but I had, had the uh, manpower to go out and gather all the affidavits to rehabilitate those signatures, in, especially in, what, a 48-hour period, um, to get 300 affidavits um, uh, signed by those voters saying that they had actually signed my petition. All they did was they changed the law so that the next time around, you can't just be slated by your committeeman. You have to go out and get those signatures again, the same amount, and then be challenged again over those signatures. So all they do is they change the law every time um, there's another voice on the ballot. And so you have to stay five steps ahead at all times. Um, the, um, in other states, the, the State Board of Elections is there to facilitate elections. Their mission is to help people get on the ballot. In this state, it is entirely different. In this state, they act as if they have nothing to do with elections. You brought those papers in, we have nothing to do with that. Uh, I'm going to give you an example. This week I've been challenged just to try and get on the school board, um, just to try and get on the ballot for the school board in the Cicero Berwyn area. Okay, um, I've been challenged before and knocked off the ballot to try and run for school board before in the same area. And uh, there is a form that you have to submit called the Statement of Economic Interests. All your petitions can be fine, your statement of candidacy, everything notarized as it's supposed to be. But if you um, somehow put that, that uh, form in wrong, which is provided by the State Board of Elections, then they can knock you off the ballot for that. Okay, I'm being challenged because I submitted what they call the state form rather than the county form, the one that's supposed to go to the county rather than the state form, although they're, it, they're almost identical. Um, one says, you, have you um, done business with a local government? 
and the other one says, have you done business in the state of Illinois? Okay, it's a simple syllogism. If you're doing business with the local government, you're doing business in the state of Illinois. Uh oh I don't know what that. Mayor Daly cut off the microphone. I guess so. <laughs> anyway, so um, now they, the, the others that were, are running also that are not connected with the city of Cicero, those people are being challenged for Illinois and um, third parties can get behind because basically it's just talking about this challenge system, how, how broken our election system is if there is such a problem with ballot access for any individual, even if you're very organized, even if you go out and get thousands and thousands of signatures, you can still be thrown off the ballot in a very unfair process. It, and it is not reflective of the national trend. Um, we are one of the few states where it's very difficult to get on the ballot. So I think that um, uh, this federal lawsuit is something that hopefully everybody will know about in the state of Illinois um, next summer when it really comes um, to court. And um, I'm hoping that uh, it's something that actually we should have an, a forum about here so that you guys know about it. Thank you. We have another one. We got nobody else. Let's see. Uh, There's Laura Murray. He's going up there. Okay. There you go. All right. Doctor. Three more people. We often talk about the ways that we can reform government, about new systems in place that might work or not work. I appreciate our speaker's work in what he does, but I really believe that the only real way to make any change is to bring new blood into the system. All right. yes. in, in the federal government, I, according to a recent book on uh, by Michael Mendelbaum and George Friedman, on uh, why and that and why why them was us, they I'm sorry and that was us. In their last chapter, they recommend a very good, very simple way to change government, and that is with the advocacy of third parties. If you remember, real maybe many of you remember the election when Clinton and Bush and we had another guy by the name H. Ross Perot running for President of the United States. Oh, he almost did it. Yes. He almost did it and he did introduce both candidates to be a little bit more open and transparent about what they believed in. For example, in that classic debate, Perot was all anti-NAFTA, Bush was all pro-NAFTA, and Clinton was the conciliator in that debate. We've also seen several reforms from previous third-party candidacies, amongst which, from almost a century ago, is Theodore Roosevelt and the Bull Moose Party. Eight-hour days, sick leave, other labor reforms, things like this. You, the Washington has been gridlocked under, under a third, under a two-party system for many, many years, and I think still the quickest way to efficate change at that federal level would be with the introduction of a good, plausible third-party candidate. And in the state of Illinois, it may be the same thing, and it also has everything to do with ballot issues, getting rid of the status quo. Mm -hmm. Anytime you have a little bit of competition that's fair and open, you're going to get a much better result. Yeah. And sometimes, in the fed, especially in the federal level where we have our entrenched congressmen, a good shaking up from a good third party might be the way to really get these entrenched politicians out of, out of there. Right now the Republicans are so entrenched in their extremist positions, the Democrats are established and entrenched in their extremist positions that nothing gets done. Perhaps it may be time to bring a third party candidate or candidates in an established third party that might just shake things up. I don't say they'll win, but they will shake up the status quo enough that it'll really firmly, I believe, bring out the true, the uh, true motives of the established political parties. Once a third party candidate gets in and he shakes it up enough, usually change happens pretty fast and pretty quick. Thank you.
But having said that, the following should be noted. I do disagree with what you said about redistricting. For years, the Republicans had things their own way. And all of a sudden, the Democrats get in there, and all of a sudden, you hear this pious bleeding about how redistricting is bad, or at least the way it's currently done is bad, and that we should throw the whole thing out. And it kind of seems to me, not necessarily so much from the people in this room, but I've heard the same arguments made by Republicans that um, this, the whole system is bad. Well, it seems to be bad from their point of view only because the Democrats now are running the system and not the Republicans. <laughs> and I think that's pretty much what redistricting seems to boil down to. It all depends on whose ox is gored. Um, the other thing that I was a little concerned about when you said that you advocated ideas that would prohibit people from voting twice. What's wrong with that? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> Suffice it to say that I am a long-time supporter, as I have said, of, Cook, of, of Chicago and Cook County Democrats. And double voting. Oh. <laughs> vote early one, and vote One fool at a time. Vote early and vote often, right? <laughs> But having said that, I agree with most of what our speaker said. And he is to be commended for coming out here, particularly in such a cold weather as this. And uh, for that, I thank you. All right, all right. How do we get the voters at Rose House going? Double, double. Yeah. How about those proxy voters at Rose Hill? Those proxy voters at Rose Hill. <laughs> This year's? Yeah. All right, let's thank our speaker for again coming out on the frosty evening here, and I've got a lot of time here tonight. Oh, he will. All right, this one I like to see in that movie where the guy is the incumbent candidate seeking re election, and he, and he runs on a campaign of reform. <laughs> oh, no. oh, reform. <laughs> we need reform. <laughs> uh, and that's correct here. I just love that reform. I always say that. Uh, my only experience recently in state politics was to go to the state fair and then I objected because the Department of Natural Resources had a shooting range for children. And I wrote some letters for the local newspapers. And I was informed by some of the gun people never to go back to Springfield. <laughs> 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 Stay out of town. <laughs> the NRA, you know, the, don't go south of 80 or something like this. Uh, thank you very much for the handout here. I find it singularly amazing that the state of Illinois is is imperfect in exactly 12 ways <laughs> and can be corrected by exactly doing 12 things. Well, I guess that's the way things turn out. 12 years. <laughs> yeah, just 12 things wrong and 12 corrective measures here. You know, <laughs> those strong bodies 12 ways. Um, let's see. Um, the I, I must confess that, you know, I'm a, I'm a Quinn 
Quinn guy. <coughs> my buddy was a Quinn man. And uh, uh, he's given a lot of time and effort to the state of Illinois. And if anything regarding the current elections, I really don't know that much about this state thing. Most of my stuff is at the federal level. But I, I really don't know how <coughs> the state is going to be served by this carpetbagger. Yeah, he's yeah. actually a criminal. He should be in jail. The people below him are going to end up in trouble. I don't, I, I don't know. It. I mean, Quinn goes back a long way to the Constitutional Convention. Heck, I was in college and I was working with them. But uh, no, I, I, I can't, I can't go along with that. Um, this thing about getting on the ballot, and Rita was talking about. Um, yeah, the system is rigged by the established parties against, really, they're writing the rules. Um, some people don't know this. The only reason Barack Obama was able to succeed and get on the ballot and get started on this, and I'm absolutely, totally certain, absolutely certain about this because I know the circumstances. You talk about somebody who knows the rules. It was, a, it was an elderly couple, senior members of the Independent Voters of Illinois, who liked him. And they thought he was a nice young man. Ella Lois is a friend of mine. She was a South Sider. And they steered him through the electoral process. They really did. And she knew it better than anybody in IVI. Her and her husband knew these rules, like this, you were talking about. They were the absolute experts that we all went to because they spent decades at it. And they liked them. As a matter of fact, they ended up getting a little upset with him because he got a, made friends with uh, Daly. And actually, they ended up having some words with him. But they took him under their wing and steered him through the electoral process. Um, towards that. Let's see, but, um, you know, this thing about the voters, I don't understand these motor, motor voters. It used to be, and this guy was talking about it, you used to go around, if you had to go around, and we used to verify how many people lived in a building, how many were registered voters, things like that. It, it's not that people didn't vote, but man, we, we made certain everybody was registered. And I don't know what happened, but no, I used to go out on evenings like this, and we'd have the list and the addresses, and in the dark, trying to see who was there and make certain ringing doorbells, are there new tenants, and things like that. But that was part of the political process, was to go out and register those people in votes like that. That was part of the how a party organized and did accomplish this thing, was to get the voters in that fashion. Uh, we, the other thing, he spoke here earlier, and I just got an email this week. As a matter of fact, it's really kind of scary. Uh, Mark Lovis spoke here, uh, and he's a veteran in the election process and city government, and even he's having difficulty uh, getting on the ballot. He sent an email out there that didn't look positive. And yes, it's amazing that even people who are seasoned veterans of the entire process can effectively be kept off the ballot. I, I just find that amazing. He's, he's spent years at this. They forget about early and often. You know, know. and as mobile voters, I'm, I'm not too certain. <laughs> you know, I mean, um, yes, we, we don't want to deny anybody one, the right of franchise, but then again, I do think there has to be some hardcore responsibility here. I don't, I don't know what the onerous part of registering to vote is. Uh, and then again, that was the responsibility of the political parties to see to it that all voters within a particular jurisdiction were in fact registered and current voters and things of that nature. So there was, a, there was a somebody there to assist them. I don't think the mobile thing takes care of that. As a matter of fact, I'm not, I'm not even certain. I'm not up on this issue. But um, I don't know if it's necessarily a thing. 
Last of all, uh, regarding your, your close affiliations with the Civic Federation, I've already articulated my views. Regarding them, um, the Civic Federation and I have been sparring in their representatives for a number of years. Um, and the last time I encountered a representative of them, I su suggested that the guy cross the picket line because it would make him feel better. Which gives me some indication of where they are. Anyhow, thanks a lot. We appreciate your coming out tonight. Bravo. And go out the boat. Get them oh. green goats. Put some greenies in. Oh, yeah, not libertarian. Not green. Any more speakers? Any more speakers? What about any more speakers? We have an open mic. If there's no more speakers, we'll have our last guy rebut. Last rebutter is our speaker. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Great. Well, well, thanks again for having me out, and I, I just really appreciate that you're engaging with the, the material on these issues, and they're just so important. Um, I, I really wanted to just put a finer point on two things, or three. The first is, is that I, I agree with you that the media generally isn't covering the other candidates, the independent-minded candidates, the third-party candidates, just because uh, someone has a low chance of winning doesn't mean they have no chance of winning, particularly in the mayoral campaign. And I do think the press has just not done a good job of paying attention in this current municipal election to the, the folks who are, um, you know, particularly in the mayoral campaign, to the folks who currently aren't mayor. Um, it's something that, that we as readers need to ask them to do. Um, and if they're not, then we need to use the power of the blogosphere and social media and everything else and email just to let our friends know about what's going on. Um, on the issue of ballot access, I, I agree. I think it's so extraordinarily important. Um, I, I would, again, as you can probably tell from hearing me earlier, I'm not a huge advocate for third parties. What I am an advocate for more broadly is for independent-minded thinking. And whether someone is a Republican, a Democrat, or from Green, Libertarian, whatever they are, um, I just think it's really important that we make it easier for people who are smart folks, well-qualified, or frankly, unqualified but passionate to be able to get on the ballot if they do what it is legally necessary to do to get on there. The fact that every day, every election, people are knocked off for no other reason than they're not sticking with the party line is just a real problem in the state. And I think that um, a big issue is the Illinois State Board of Elections. Um, I, quietly, the torch was passed, and we do have a new executive director of ISB now. Um, for better or worse, he was the former general counsel under the former regime, but he seems like an intelligent person. It is possible that things will change. Um, the person who had run it had been in the ISB for something like uh, 28 or 29 years. So hopefully things will get better, and it's up to us to push for changes. Again, if there's, there's one theme that I want to leave you with tonight, it's there's a lot of stuff that's boring but important, but just because it's boring doesn't mean it isn't very important. And we need to just elevate these issues. And then on the redistricting issue, I, I do think you're right that a lot of Republicans were fine with redistricting here in Illinois during the um, early 90s when they drew the maps. A lot of Democrats weren't happy with it. There are a lot of Democrats who are unhappy with maps in North Carolina or Mississippi or Texas who might have been happy before. I think those of us who regardless of party, just think that citizens deserve to have a right to vote for people that represent them, that the politicians should not be choosing the voters, that we should be choosing our representatives, want to change the redistricting system, whether it's in Illinois or any other state. And, and I agree with you, that there's a lot of political stuff here, but just because there's politics doesn't mean there isn't a right thing to do for all of us, no matter what our political beliefs are. So I just wanted to say thank you again. It's really fun to come out here and debate with folks and hear what you have to say. So thanks again. That I heard from the uh, you all 2014 uh, midterm elections is that uh, the Democrats received five million more votes than than Republicans. Yet 
Republicans control the House of Representatives. Yeah, that just came out. Yeah, they don't. Uh, Let's count more votes. Like quite a lot. Just 20 million. Ain't that off?